music Camera by Casket Bound. Uh, <laughs> there there uh, it goes. Uh. Okay. Hello, podcast land and YouTube. It's uh, been a while. I've been slacking, <laughs> obviously. And uh, Rachel's been busy. Rachel's come over to us uh, from our other podcast. Really, and we're going to try and do this more regularly. So, say hello, Rachel. Hello. <laughs> uh, if people don't know who you are, how how would you describe yourself and what you do now? I am a weird philosopher slash artist. I'm focused on the intersection between art and technology and the weird visionary aspects of creativity and how creativity scales on a subcultural and creative level. You know, um, so all, all those fun things, art, subculture, creativity, technology, where are we going with it, what's happening next, and what isn't happening also. Yeah. All very interesting stuff and if you don't know me why are you here but i am a game designer and an author and i tinker in a, in a lot of other things and i spend a lot of time thinking about stuff so today we're going to talk about really exciting topics like shipping and infrastructure <laughs> Uh, but we're going to talk about that in terms of technology and changes that might be coming up now there has been a global problem with shipping partly because of the rona uh, and here in the uk partly because of brexit but this is also a long-term problem people aren't going into long-haul trucking in anything like the numbers that they used to the pay doesn't rate it's a hard life you're away from home the reason things have been difficult during the Rona is that everyone has been ordering everything online. <laughs> and so there's been a lot more shipping going on and that has put huge pressure on the system. And then we've had things like great big ships getting stuck in canals and all kinds of other issues. And here in the UK, due to the problems with Brexit, we don't have immigrant drivers from Europe to ship our stuff around our country, which is why there's been a huge run on fuel <laughs> just these last few days here in the UK, and why a lot of shop shelves are starting to get rather empty, uh, which is obviously worrying a lot of people. So where does the interesting part of this come in with the technology? Well, Tesla, has a semi truck and they're really talking more and more about automating shipping so we would have these uh, automated electric trucks which you know does away with the problem of drivers and does away with a lot of a lot of other issues but is it practical um so to to kick us off what do you think the future is here, Rachel? What, how do you think we can cope with these issues and, and problems? Well, I like the idea of drone shipping. I think that you should just be able to hit up a drone and get what you want. And I don't think it needs to be done with like those little Tesla bots that it could. I think like DIY drones are really a fun idea people being able to ship to each other across the world through creating their own drones and, you know, kind of like decentralizing the whole shipping apparatus, especially with the delays and times. I think we have an opening to be able to start our own drone shipping entities, you know, um, more, hmm. more drones, more shipping, more, more options. I mean, we've had those um, pizza delivery robots for a little while, but they keep getting vandalized. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's been experiments uh, with using drones to deliver medical supplies to places like uh, remote Australian communities 
in the outback and so on, which is okay for packages like like Amazon or whatever, but for for mass shipping, you really need rail, which isn't a problem so much, um, and you need the, these these lorries. The problem, as I see it, is that this Tesla Semi only has a range of about three hundred to four hundred miles on its on its batteries, right? And then it's going to have to stop for a considerable amount of time. To charge, though that though that's improving, whereas existing diesel trucks can go 1,400 miles on on a tank of diesel or or biodiesel. So it, it doesn't seem like it's the it's the magic solution, um, even without the automation, to me. Yeah, I mean. There's going to be a problem with whatever app is used because, you know, humans are prone to error, you know, and technology is prone to error too. Hmm. So I think that we should select for multiplicity here. I think, you know, trains are going to have their issues. Drones are going to have their issues. Little robot cars are going to have their issues. But maybe if you can use trains and drones and robot cars, maybe one of them will work. Yeah. And I, I think we never should have stopped using canals, really, because it's a really cheap way to ship stuff that doesn't have to get there in a hurry. I don't mean the big canals like the Panama Canal. I mean, like like here in the UK, the old Victorian canal network is all still there. It just needs digging out. But, you know, th there's, there's all kinds of options with different possibilities. Yeah, and I think there's a lot that we haven't even tapped into yet. Now, from what you were saying about the stores now, it sounds like something out of 28 Days Later. You know, there's a zombie apocalypse. There's quite a bit of scarcity with everything that's going on. And, you know, people are trying to survive. And when people are in survival mode, they tend to be more innovative. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll have helicopters that ship things. Maybe we'll have a new type of flying train. Or, you know, maybe the drones will become more robust. I mean, there's a world of possibilities, you know, like, because when things go bad, that's when innovation tends to happen. People, they look for ways out and, you know, it's the old saying, constraint gives way to creativity. Well, we, we worked together on those video presentations for that drone blimp company. Uh, that's Airship. right. That's right. Those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Now that is interesting to me because those are a lot less... Uh, intense and dangerous compared to to prop drones um they're yeah. a lot less obtrusive less noisy um and they can carry pretty significant payloads um yeah, they're more like you know boat drones in a way because they're blimps too so it's more like a surfer kind of drone that you would find at the beach you know like you would go surfing and then the little blimp drone would come and like deliver your package to you you know while you're like all decked out on your towel and you know you've got your margarita in your hand <laughs> yeah uh, everyone who looks to the future thinks, you know, wants to get blimps back. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's a, maybe that's the way of doing it. Blimps and drones and robots. Oh my! <laughs> I mean, but, I, yeah. I think I think they're they're all fun, but they're all you know prone to error. Yeah, and they're all just only like humans. Yeah, and they're all only part of the solution. Um, it's yeah. just we've we've become so dependent on trucking. And yeah. on just-in-time shipping, and it's it's really brought home to me this last couple of years just how fragile this whole just-in-time shipping thing is. It's yeah. just not a robust system at all. If anything goes wrong, everything <laughs> goes wrong. Unfortunately, right, right. It's kind of like civilization has crashed a bit. You know, yeah. like all these degrowth people are, are kind of having their day. They're all um, like returning to nature on their little farms and. <laughs> You know, it's a environmental activism for a lot of people. <laughs> They're like, cool, let's start doing nothing and let's stall every industry. Let's stop everything from happening. No, like, actually, let's not do that because people, <laughs> they need to have things shipped to them. You know, like medical equipment, for example. Yeah, but but we've had that happen as well. All this extra strain on the delivery systems and... Yep. 
you know, and there's a lot of upward pressure on wages and things now, um, yeah. you know, because we need all these extra people to deliver yeah. things. But it's it's a waste of the. <laughs> yeah, it's always the last. Maybe just get a robot in space with their shipping containers and their robot spaceships. <laughs> and I'm sure Elon has something like this that he's already doing. I, I think he missed a trick with the Tesla Semi. He should have called it Optimus Grimes. <laughs> right. Or that's what she could call her new her new album when she like <laughs> evolves into her AI self. Yeah, that's like the Grimes two point <laughs> Gets the matrix of leadership. Um, but, <laughs> but the the other aspect to to the Tesla thing, yeah, you know, I think electric vehicles is a good idea. I just don't think it's going to work for yeah, shipping. And there are other people besides Elon that can get in on it. Yeah, for whatever reason. And people are like, oh, well, well, Elon has done it, so it's it's done. Well, you know, you could do it, too. You yeah. might know some other people that want to do it. You might just do it like a maker hackerspace. You might just hook up your own spaceship and set up your yeah. own shipping service. You know, I mean, it's always the hackers and the makers in the underground who, you know, really kick this stuff off. And then people like Elon come on or later, you know, and like make it more rational and they make it work better you know yeah. um, they, they scale it and refine <laughs> it you know but you know you don't need to wait around you know like if you really want to ship something you, you can be creative with it you know you, you can yeah. you can diy instead of uh, a rig and then the electric jesus can descend from the stars and give it a bit of a <laughs> spit shine and a polish <laughs> so is this like the singularity or like x day or is this like the the q and on thing <laughs> I mean, is all of it the same? Uh, like, wait, what's the difference between like Q day and like X day and like the singularity and like, isn't it all just like a utopian moment where people get what they want because they don't have what they want? I, th I don't know. See, the the singularity sounds hopeful to me, whereas the whole Q day thing it all does, like the same doesn't. <laughs> it all just seems like mythology. It mm. all just seems like a way for people to be like, on this day, we're going to get all the things that we want because we don't have them right now. It comes from a place of scarcity. It'll all yeah. be fixed when so-and-so comes, you know, when, when Jesus comes, when, you know, it, it's all like mythologies about people wanting stuff they don't have and getting those things on those days, right? Yeah. Though the, the Q side is more about um, getting revenge on perceived yeah, elites and, and nasty people. <laughs> I know. There's a, a lot of elites and a lot of nasty people on all sides. So, well, um, yeah. I mean, you you ran for president. You know better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, there, there are going to be nasty elites everywhere. But I, I was just thinking about like how all of these mythological days, you know, were like the big thing is supposed to happen. It all just seems very cope to me. It just seems like. People, they, they don't have what they want, <laughs> you know, and they're like, well, we're going to get it on this day. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, every every ideology or, or religion or cult or even cults of personality, you know, it's uh, I alone can fix it sort of so the thing. It's, it's all trading in that. If you come along beside them with a more pragmatic philosophy, oh, oh well, maybe we could cut down on this and do a bit more of that. <laughs> And things yeah. things might get gradually just a little bit better, uh, yeah. <laughs> incremental steps. Incre incrementally, yeah. No, no one's interested it's in agile. that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm like agile. Is that like a club or like some software? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's at the point where people are just very resistant to doing much of anything at any type. Of yeah. scaler moments right did, now, when they're all just tiptoeing their way through innovation. I mean, it's, it's not even innovation at this point. It's it's just like a fear. Yeah, there's there's not many people who are doers, um, and the people who are doers aren't exactly perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. I think, especially now, you know, people are more afraid of doing anything. <laughs> You yeah, know, 
global pandemic, um, the different variants, Delta, Gamma, Kappa, you know. Yeah. It's like, they were already scared of doing shit before. Now it's like, <laughs> we're still, it's like civilization stopped. You know, everybody just pressed pause. It's like, are, are we, um, what is it, that scene in X-Men where everything just like freezes? Yeah. I, I think that's like where we are now as a society. <laughs> Though, uh, what's what's interesting to me is everyone's basically stopped being a civilization very much for get, you know, getting on for two years now. And it's only dropped um, the sort of carbon output by about 7%, if I remember correctly, globally. So right. it's not individual people and their cars and their homes and their quality of life that is really causing the problem for the environment. It's it's the big corporate producers. It's the it's the power generation. It's right. things but you like that. Kick down the little guy. Yeah, you, you do. Blame the little people. Yeah, stay home. Do your recycling. Right. Uh, you know, buy the latest electric car. You you do all that comp- compost your waste. <laughs> you know all of these things. And yeah, <laughs> compost your waste. Yeah, and it's, it, very, it's where they live. You know? <laughs> Live in the pod, eat the bugs, ignore what these big corporations are doing. I think pods are cool. I mean, like, I have a contrarian stance. Like, because I went to an esoteric insect restaurant, like, a decade ago, (laughs) and, like, we had some sweet bugs. I'm sorry, dude, but they were good. I've had uh, had candied (laughs) uh, locusts or grasshoppers. Yeah, Yeah. that's kind of cool. Like, I I had a, a scorpion. It was amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, so you know, like I'm, I'm pro bug. I'm, I'm pro pod. I think you can have a really innovative pod. You know, I think it's a good alternative to like living in tents. Everybody's living in tents now. At least <laughs> if you have a pod, you can like deck it out. You know, and like have cool art in it. You know, and like make architecture that suits your yeah. aesthetic interest. You know, like you, you can have a pretty cool pod. I think a lot of people are like really against like individuality. You know, and a pod to them represents, like, the atomized the individual. But these are the same people that are moving to a farm, you know, to, like, return to nature. that are having, like, ten kids. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, the other thing that's happening is this big move back to uh, communal living uh, because it's oh, just yeah. impossible for anyone to afford a house. So... Yeah. <laughs> You know, they they all uh, they all get together, club together, and get a place. Or you know, like we've got shared workspaces, and now Amazon is building little Amazon communities, which just yeah, you know, I know my history, and you know, mining companies and things used to do that. Yeah, you owed everything to the company store. I'm a bit worried that Amazon's going <laughs> to be like that. You know, it could be. I mean. I, I'm looking for a place with some friends. We want to get a nice loft, you know, and, mm. like, split the rent and, you know, eventually buy a loft and then rent it out to other artists because artists need places to live and we don't know how he's, you know, like, have the best credit scores. So, I mean, even even before COVID, it was hard to, like, get a nice place in a big city. You yeah. Know? Um, so you're seeing a lot of creative people move to you know, like rural suburban areas that aren't really good for their growth because they yeah. can't afford to live in the big city. So it makes sense that people are pulling together to, to get places together. I mean, that, that's definitely like what I'm doing out here. Yeah. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, in the Bay Area, you know, rents were really, really high. Even before COVID, you had like 10 people living together in like collective art houses and like founder houses and bitcoin houses and (laughs) hacker houses burning man houses and that's just like the norm out there yeah but house sharing is oh it just it just sucks it doesn't matter how much you like the people you live with (laughs) would you rather live in like a big city with a few roommates or would you rather live in like bumfuck Oh, I do live in bumfuck. <laughs> well, maybe that that works for you. I don't know. Like, I'm I'm of the mind like after having lived in bumfuck that I'd actually like rather have a shared space than live alone in bumfuck. Yeah. Well, this was the only way I would ever really get a house, so I didn't have a lot of choice. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm like, see, I I haven't bought a house because 
I know like if I'm in Bangkok for more than like a week, I'll end up like killing myself, you know? <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm a renter, you know, I'm one of the like lower elements of society, but like, is it really worth it to become a, you know, one of the middle classes and like yeah. live in the middle of nowhere? Like, that's yeah. I like I need inspiration. I yeah, need but, culture. Yeah, yeah, I, I do miss miss that. Um, I've never lived in a city. I lived in a pretty big town called Basingstoke. The great thing about Basingstoke is it's easy to leave and go somewhere else. <laughs> right, it's it, like the it's, California, but like you can leave. Yeah, because <laughs> it's on the main train line to London and all. So oh, yeah, yeah, it it was easy to go other places from Basingstoke nice. and it was a town nice. so there were a few more facilities a, a little bit of culture yeah nice. so I, I, I do miss that but I like having a roof over my head and knowing you know I'm not going to be out on the street if I miss a month's rent <laughs> you know, yeah I don't know like as someone who has like been on the street before I, I still don't want to live in the middle of nowhere um, but that, that's why I'm pulling together with my friends you know we're looking to get a place up north somewhere by Boston you know just like a shared loft I love the loft environment. I find it just inspiring for my work. Um, but I do want to get a house eventually. And I figure, you know, like by saving up in a city where I can make a lot of money in because there are a lot of opportunities for growth that I can eventually get a house in a city, you know, that isn't in the middle of nowhere. Maybe it's not going to be like New York, you know, um, but it'll at least have like enough entertainment for me to to be like happy <laughs> um, I don't know, but you know, like um, when I was living in Texas, I realized that the reason a lot of people were religious, at least it seemed like this to me, like was because they were very happy with very little and they had adjusted to the very like sub standard ways of life, mm. you know, um, living in very bad conditions and they found God and suddenly everything was okay. You know, where like the artists and philosophers traditionally want to live in like more expensive cities where life is harder um, and they're more atheists, you know, and agnostics yeah. because they're not happy just like living on a farm, you know, like they, they need more. So I, I yeah. think it depends on like who you are, you know, I mean, I, I guess it's getting easier with like the Internet and like digital and virtual communities. Yeah, I'd have gone mad without the internet, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I. I, mean, <laughs> I think artists and philosophers need to live in cities because you just can't get a decent cup of coffee in Spittoon, Texas, or something. <laughs> right, right, and none of the coffee shops are open for very late either. <laughs> like we need, we need twenty four hour coffee shops so we can talk about philosophy. Yeah. We need that. If we don't, yeah. like, we, we just, like, write manifestos and, like, bad things happen. Yeah. Can you imagine living in one of these Amazon pods, though? It's like, good morning, Dave. You called in sick. <laughs> but Alexa has detected you're on your third wank. Please report to work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if I was, like, paid enough by Jeff Bezos, I would be happy to, like, design one of the pods. <laughs> He's certainly got enough money to burn. Okay, so wrestling us somewhat adroitly back back onto topic i guess um <laughs> so a lot of these long haul trucks you basically have an apartment in the back right which is kind of like one of these pods but the other aspect i wanted to really um get into on on that topic was the automation so right so most people don't seem to want these long haul truck jobs anymore you know the training's difficult the pay's not great it's it's an unhealthy lifestyle all of those other things mean that less people want to do it even though we need more of it so it seems like an obvious market for automation to come in but i don't know that the self-driving technology is there yet or if it necessarily ever will be or how it will cope with things like customs or you know immigrants piling into the back to get across the border or or being held up and robbed you know there's no people to kill so it might seem more appealing to to steal from one of these trucks you know if you know how their programming works it's easy to stop them things like that uh, and there was that incident a few days ago um 
I think it was a Tesla car, um, getting accredited to run on Chinese roads. So he did a braking test, and the automated car just rammed straight through a mannequin they had as part of the test. Right. It's like yeah. crash test dummies all over again. Yeah. I mean, you have to acknowledge that the media has a bias here, and they're going to look for the catastrophic stories of things going wrong. Oh, and... yeah. That's um, that's what gets the clicks. Yeah. But, you know, like, if you try to do it the other way, that can have its issues, too. Like, remember Upworthy? It was like, women smiles at an immigrant kid and yeah. gives her flowers. You know, um, <laughs> that, that didn't really work either, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, like the news is, uh, well, it's narrative based, and it's not what really happens. It's somebody's story. Mm. You know, these are stories that people are telling about events that occur. So, yeah, you know, whatever gets attention is what's going to make it through. And it's best to take it all with a grain of salt. You know, like if you want to know what happened. You know, like go there on the ground. See yeah, for and the media's given up all pretense at even trying to be objective. Unfortunately, oh yeah, it's it's just like competing narrative factions of like media thugs trying to, you know, compete for people's attention. Mm. And but you should you... just like ignore it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's it, ignore all. Of it, yeah, it. if it's that important, you probably can't do anything about it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, be, be realistic. You know, you're you're not sovereign. You're just like weird. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what do you do? You think we lose something with this automation? The thing is, like, most jobs are bullshit jobs. That don't really <laughs> don't really right. need a person to do them. They're not um, emotionally satisfying. They're not challenging. They're not stimulating. Um, yeah. When it comes to most jobs, so are, well, do we do we lose anything through automation? Or, you know, is there a point where we should stop with automation? Um, I think that you know, like when you go to San Francisco, there's a bunch of poo on the streets, and I think that it would be better if humans didn't have to clean it up like i'm surprised that they don't have like poo cleaning robots right now for all this <laughs> talk about automation like you still have people doing really degrading things mm. that i can't see like any positive thing about and they're not getting paid very much um so you've got people talking about automation taking all the jobs and then you like wire on the robots cleaning up the poo um so i, I don't know um I think automation is definitely good for a lot of people who aren't able to do the things that would be required, you know, um, like simple things like building a, a house, you know, mm -hmm. um, like people flip houses and they usually hire, you know, workers to do that and the workers need the money to do that, you know, so that's great that the workers are getting paid to build the houses. Um, but say um, it's more like you're, you're digging a, a ditch, you know, yeah. and like you're digging out some, some mud you know wouldn't it be better if if we didn't have to do that as humans you know isn't it better to not have to do these things yeah i mean i'm sure there are some perverse weird people who who really go off on digging ditches well, but I mean, I, if, you, if you want to dig a ditch like don't let any robots stop you you know <laughs> start like a ditch digging company and like be be better than the robots um i don't know i feel like a lot of people are run employed now there's a lot of gig economy stuff happening and a lot of people have their own companies and now most people are just like investors or like stock traders because of like game stop and yeah. you know like crypto where we're mostly just seeing like a proletariat investors at this point <laughs> everyone's hustling yeah it's a grifter society um, but we, we are really seeing like the proletariatization of the stock trading. I think that's the the way to to phrase it. You know, like anybody can invest in a shitcoin now. Yeah. Um, and I think like the younger people, they're not looking for jobs. You know, they're they're looking for like 
which shit coin to invest in. <laughs> or to I, become... I, mean, like, I don't have very many... Sorry, go ahead. Or to become YouTube celebrities. I think that was the, um, right. that was the top answer kids answered in Britain <laughs> so last sad. year. That's so sad, though. You know, like, because if you think about, like, how few people actually make... A decent living on YouTube, yeah. You know, and all the people that cry and they they kiss so much ass and like suck up to the same influencers, and then it just doesn't amount to anything. And no. then they just like end up looking for a job anyway. <laughs> yeah, and you sell your soul to the algorithm, and it, it even then it doesn't get you anywhere. Of course, I I it's do YouTube, I do YouTube wrong because I don't stick to one topic or, uh, <laughs> or anything. I mean, so. you're, you're supposed to like repeat the same phrases all the time and. You know, you, you do have to adjust yourself to the algorithm and you have to, you know, like even even on Substack, if you're a writer, you're supposed to like interview prolific, you know, bloggers, you know, like in your genre, you know, like you're supposed to get, get guest bloggers and they have yeah. to be big names. And, you know, if you don't have that celebrity on your show, <laughs> good luck. <you> know. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it definitely doesn't seem like a, a viable occupation for many people like uh, YouTube celebrity hood um it's it's a good hobby though it's a good way to yeah. like, hang out with your friends maybe a little side hustle um but I, I really do see like more people just getting into stocks and crypto as like the new way for people to make money and it really yeah. seems to be like i mean and people are so lazy <laughs> you know like they, they don't they don't want to work they they just want to trade and debt and i think that in the next few years the the majority of people are not going to be working. They're just going to mm. be trading. It's just going to be trading that, everywhere. Maybe I'm weird, but that just doesn't sound satisfying to me either. It doesn't sound like you're accomplishing anything. No, they don't want to accomplish anything. You know, like um, effort is for losers. They just want to like sit around and like bet on shit coins. That for them, that's accomplishing enough. Mm. They, they don't really have high aspirations. I mean, I just like, wonder what they do with the rest of their time. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I guess they just sleep and fucking meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Do hot yoga. Yeah. Right, right, right. Blogs about self improvement and then trade more shit coin. <laughs> <laughs> Agonize about what they're doing to the environment with their Bitcoin investments in bubble tea bars or something. Right. They protest global warming while burning down the. <laughs> whatever I, I i don't know anymore but yeah. i know that less people are working than ever and that there are more shit coins than i've ever seen in my entire life and there seems to be some kind of correlation yeah i mean <laughs> maybe i'm connecting dots but <laughs> freaking, you know, call me crazy but i'm seeing random pattern recognition but a lot more shit coins yeah i i i keep it's almost become a catchphrase for me now i keep saying look it's basic income or the guillotine <laughs> whoa, 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 calm you, calm you. <laughs> yes. Calm down, James. Like, I don't know about that. Like, because we, we'd be the first to, like, die. Well, I'm not advocating right. that we, I'm not advocating <laughs> that we go out and cut people's heads off. I just, no, th- I, I, I. If we have a society like that, they're not going to spare you. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, glasses wearing intellectual. I, I, you know, I know what happened in Cambodia. Right. I, I'm done. I'm like fucking if, done for. You have less money than them. You're still like an intellectual Marxist bag, you know, because you're like <laughs> smart and autistic or whatever. You know? <laughs> I, I forget what your mental disorder is, but like if you're um, neurotic, it doesn't matter how poor you are. You're still one of the elite. You yeah. know, <laughs> they're not going to spare you. You're you're smart and you're weird. You're going off the chopper. So yeah, yeah. Th- throw a dart into the into the DSV and you probably hit something. I've got. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I don't think we lose anything particularly, other than bullshit jobs for people so that they can you know live. Um, if we automate trucking and deliveries and like yeah. you say digging digging ditches and stuff like that and yeah but i do think we need something like a basic income to help the people who are going to have no prospect of work you know whatsoever and it's got to be more than enough to just live it's got to be enough to 
hustle a little bit, you know, enjoy your life, set up your own business, you know? I'd I'd love to see that, but I don't think that it's a sustainable model. I think it should be, but, you know, people, I'm, I guess I'm more of like a Hobbesian or a Nietzschean here. I think that no matter how much people have, there are still going to be criminals, there are still going to be like riots and there's still going to be like people digging at each other's throats for like the last scrap. You know, you yeah. could have like everybody could have their basic needs met and there'd still be like thousands of people fighting over a tiny little piece of whatever. Yeah. Humans I... are, you know, conflict driven and, you know, prone to ego and like personal differences and you know they're they're very like vanguardist and and these these are the good ones you know the, <laughs> the ones that actually care about stuff yeah so. i mean I, I don't i don't think there is um a perfect society i don't think you can completely do away with violence or sexual exploitation or drug abuse or, or whatever else but it seems to me that if you do meet people's basic needs you at least cut that down and the statistics do seem to bear that out. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I would like to see that. There's no reason that people should have to go homeless or hungry, especially with the amount of military spending. The yeah. The money that goes to government agencies that spy on people. You would think that some of that money would go to, like, housing and feeding people. Yeah, but the rich need to real the the rich, the ultra rich really need to realize that it's in their own self interest to keep the wolf from poor people's door. Otherwise, you know, they start looking like lamb chops. Right. Well, you've got to like get a bunch of lamb chops together to like go to the one disaffected rich person and be like, "Hey, let's start a new society, aren't you?" Mad at your elite friends for like screwing you over, and then boom, revolution. You know? Yeah. You you have to like work across class barriers. You have it's, to. Yeah, and it's it's to bring this back round to sort of sort of um, Tesla and Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and that it's it's even despite the huge wealth disparity that we have in in both our countries and the huge unfairness of the system, lots of people treat Musk or or, or Bezos as some sort of savior. That's why I called. Um, Musk, the Electric Jesus, earlier, right? So they've got right. a lot. They've got a lot of fanboys who seem to oh. think that oh, the, these quadrillionaire oh, yeah. innovators I mean, are going to save us all. You know, I've heard horrible things about Jeff Bezos, and I believe these horrible things about him. Um, but I kind of like his style. It's kind of fashionable. He's got the sunglasses. He's kind of just like chilling, <laughs> you know. Um, and it, like Elon Musk. I mean, like a lot of people just hate him because he's a weird autistic and they yeah. hide behind like class dialogue. They pretend to hate him because he's rich. No, they hate him because he's a nerd. They hate him because he's <laughs> cringe. They make him feel, he makes them feel uncomfortable because he's a nerd and he's an extroverted nerd with neurological issues. And they do not like that because yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of people with a lot more money than Elon, but because he's the one out there. You know, people, people they just don't like that. You know, yeah. they, they don't like, um, like, like Bill Gates, you know, that, that's another <laughs> one. You know, he's like, you know, all the evil, you know, he's the, the scapegoat for everything because he's a, a, a nerd. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, like, yeah, like the, these rich people will need to, you know, be checked. Right. But. Why? Why is it the autistic rich people that are the target of so much scrutiny? Just something to consider. Yeah, and they're much more public in their personalities. But there's much, uh, well, not richer than Bezos, but there are people richer than Musk. Yeah, no, no, Bezos, he he's got way too too much money. I don't think that he should have that much money. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like I think he should give me most of it. <laughs> you know, he he should actually just give me all of it. Yeah, that would be a good way to just like solve this right now. Yeah. <laughs> so all these people who say they're um, they're against redistribution of wealth, but what they actually mean is they're against redistributing it from the rich to the poor. They're fine with it the other way around. <laughs> I think most people just want to like be comfortable and relax, and they don't really care about 
the economic issues. I, I think that people overestimate the amount of like revolution and class potential that is society. Yeah. And they'll often focus on, you know, like the, the French Revolution and you know, similar protest movements throughout history yeah. when the majority of people, like whatever their class status is, like they just want to relax, be comfortable and be left alone. Yeah. Well, OK, let, let, let's divert into uh, into class <laughs> politics for a second. So, <laughs> I'm gonna, sorry. As, as, as a hoary old socialist, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah at least in, in pragmatic terms. I'm an anarchist as well. It's complicated, but right, OK. Right, I, I, but, I get it. But as, as an old school leftist, the lack sure. of class consciousness <laughs> really pisses me off. It's like the left isn't interested in class and wealth issues anymore it's all identity politics yeah, is, is it still is it yeah. still? Cause I, I just i don't want to hear about like identity politics anymore i haven't for a few years I mean, call it different I things hear, like people complain about like wokeness but like i just i don't think those people are as visible i think they're finally gone I wish I shared your optimism. Really? I never hear about like woke people. I hear people complaining about the woke. Mm. Like I don't uh, hear about people getting cancelled. I hear people complaining uh, about cancellation. I th I think it's it still dominates over really? over the class consciousness. But I Maybe do just immune from that kind of thing now. May maybe they've all blocked you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably on, on both sides. Yeah, I see some stirrings of some more uh, more class consciousness, um, okay. like the the three trillion package that's never going to pass in the states for for infrastructure and you know societal investment. It's not going to happen. But just for the idea to be mooted by you know a, a relatively moderate doddery old Democrat, you know that. That's a yeah. that's a good sign, you know. Maybe I mean I don't think that we should have to wait for elected officials to take care of our basic needs. So I think that if we want to have like a truly insurrectionary movement of the people, that we need to do that in small communities and you know not really worry about getting well you know, people into power. We just need to like deal with things on well, our that own. Yeah, that's that. You've given me an excellent segue into the sort of um, last part of this. I really wanted to wanted to talk about. So the other option, if we can't ship stuff in in good order in in, in, in a good time, back to shipping. Yeah, uh, but if we can't do that, then the answer is to make things more locally, right? So maker yeah. communities, um, so local farms, micro farms, I guess. I'm not sure that it's economically viable, but things don't have to be economically viable to be viable. <laughs> you know, if people just donate their time or whatever to doing some of these things. So do you think that is a potential approach? Because there are things like uh, robots that can tend the garden for you now, uh, which, which are really sort of fascinating. So you can grow some basic crops without having to actually do anything yourself at all other than load the seeds in and water into the machine. And, you know, 3D printing and uh, 3D laser sintering and all of these other options are getting more and more accessible. Still beyond me, but, <laughs> but they're getting more accessible. So is, is that when, another way around this? When I hear local, I think of, like, craft breweries and, like, mm. Portland, like, pretentious. Like, we do this... <laughs> through here on our own farm yeah. and <laughs> make um, something other than an IPA it. you beardy fucks right right and then they don't even taste good it's like they, yeah. just, they taste really bad um, but I think that yeah people working together locally to take care of things on their own I think you know trading among um, ourselves you know and each other rather than like international imperialistic you know, wah wah is a good idea. Yeah. Um, See, the, the, there's the, no reason not to have a homegrown community. Yeah. See, the anarchist side of me obviously is into the idea of volunteerism, and that, sure. that and that that is a good way for things to happen. But then I also have 
practical experience that suggests that it still ends up just being a few people doing everything. <laughs> Right, um, that's just human nature. Yeah. Um, and it's less costly to a community if you spread out the cost of the people that you're carrying. Yeah, mm. you don't you don't want anyone to starve and to go without on, yeah. when you think about it abstractly on a societal basis. But if you're in a house share with Derek who never pays for the rent and is always eating your pickles, <laughs> right? Derek's an asshole, right? And you want him right. out of the house. You, you gotta yeah. like kick out Derek or like yeah. some people will, will vote to get him yeah. out. Depending but it's not on, like but it's like also if you're in a commune or a DAO yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But it's also you you don't want Derek to be homeless. You just don't want him there. I don't know. <laughs> right? I, I mean if, if Derek is like going around and like raping and like stealing, uh, you know, may, maybe he should be uh in jail or maybe maybe he shouldn't be living in your community, you mm. know? I mean maybe maybe Derek did some yeah. bad things and yeah, you don't want him living next door to you. That that escalated you know? quickly <laughs> from eating some of your pickles, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying like Oh yeah, there's always going to be people there's like that. People like you just don't want them in your communities, and <laughs> um, well, you know, like some cities like like Austin, you know, it's like a giant homeless encampment, and you've got like all these people just doing like horrible things to each other, and you know, um, if you could put them all in a hotel, you know, they they would do horrible things to each other in the hotel, you know. Well, and, um... I mean, at least they have roof over their heads. And you know what? And some of them would stop stealing, yeah. and you know. Um, but some people are, are just like brought into the core, and yeah. I, I don't think that that'll be solved by housing them. Okay. It, it'll solve it'll solve a lot. Don't get me wrong; it'll solve a lot. <laughs> but you know, there, there's a bad apple. It's gonna spoil a bunch. Yeah, yeah you're always gonna need sanctions for there, that. There's like... always gonna be a Derek who who should yeah. not be doing anything. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm sorry to all the people named Derek. <laughs> they were just plucked out of the air because I <laughs> I haven't had any housemates called Derek, so that's why I chose that name. So no one will think I'm talking about them. Um, <laughs> it's like, like Derek, get into my toys. And like, yeah, it escalates. Yeah. You, you but you know, if, if, you had, if you had small communities where you yeah. had robot gardens or if people wanted to do it themselves you know they could do it themselves you know then you could produce your food locally if you yeah. had a maker workshop where you sure. could do like cad cam and, and whatever else you can make replacement parts for your car or, or whatever yeah. um create new tools out of raw materials and so on in that that's an anti-fragile mm. way of setting up the world and and, and uh... And, and local power generation, like solar panels and, and windmills or whatever. You know, small yeah. communities could produce almost everything they need apart from raw materials. So a kind of... I don't know what you'd even call it. I mean, I guess, like, tribal communities or, you know, um, local living. There does yeah. seem to be a, a massive, like, return to this type of tribal living now. It seems yeah. to be the norm. I hear about more people doing it now than ever before. You know, it yeah. started out as like kind of a utopian idea. Um, now it just seems to be like what everyone's doing. So you you have like large companies that have their own DAOs now. Um, everybody is doing it. Yeah, this isn't just like a bunch of like artists getting together to like you know live comfortably and work yeah. together. This is like a massive global shift in the way that we live. I think it's different in America because, right, so we, we might live in a particular area and so we have a certain geographical community, but our tribe is online, right? Sure. So we, know, we all know people all around the globe. But if we wanted to bring yeah. like-minded people together in a community, there's all kinds of practical issues. Less so well, in the US because it's so big. I mean, you can throw like events in virtual reality. Like I did a Luxor salon where I brought like-minded people together to perform yeah. and speak. And they were from all over the world. And, you know, like holding digital events and holding virtual events is a good idea. 
um, if you're in a big city, I guess you would need to like not have so many restrictions for, you know, like a, yeah. a pandemic, for example. Um, but there, there tend to be like creative, like-minded people in big cities that you can like get to congregate. At, at least there, there were. I mean, maybe <laughs> there aren't so many anymore. Yeah. So yeah, I just think yeah, if different. I was going, if I was to bring people of like mind to me together in a in a commune or something in physical space you know i'd have to get people into the country from from the states from uh from finland from france um yeah all, all around new zealand i'd have to get people from all around the world and uh bring them into what has become a very small-minded xenophobic country with ever stricter border mm. controls you know it's it's wow. Yeah, that's something that's in the way. Huh. That's rough. Um, I I think that a lot of people are moving to off-the-grid communities now more than ever. Um, and, yeah, like, it, it definitely does seem to be a global phenomenon. It definitely isn't just people online. Um, because even the, the bros, the normies, whatever, like, even mm. they're participating in, like localized living experiments now in the tech industry. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's something that everybody's doing at this point. Um, and I think it is going to be adaptable on a large scale because of the amount of corporate interest that currently exists as more and more people, you know, from all walks of life realize that the economy and the infrastructure that we currently have is not sustainable. I mean, sustainability is the, the buzzword now for a reason. Mm. So I think that this is a, a mass migration to localized forms of living. Yeah. And circumstances are kind of forcing it. Um, exactly. I mean, even if you don't, even if you don't have environmental concerns or any of the other big issues, just the no, like, like lonely. You know, yeah. Been shut down for over a year and a half, and you just like want to see your friends. Yeah, and they're all scattered all over the world on the internet, and you want to be around them in person. Yeah, you know, this is like you start missing people. You miss them a lot, and you want to live where all your friends are. So you got to figure something out. Yeah, and um, you know, even if it's not the loneliness and so on, it's just the the sheer brute force of economic issues is forcing people into these communitarian living situations and uh, house house sharing or staying home with your parents until you're 40 you know that's that's yeah. becoming a necessity for a lot of people yeah i think it's sad i mean like most of the cool people that i know have died i'm one of the last like remaining punks i don't know if i'm allowed to say that if i like violated some like narcissism taboo or something but i just i don't know very many people like me anymore um that even exist at all um and the ones that did live in these collective warehouses and that kind of thing like a lot of those places are they don't exist anymore they were like bought out or you know um they got run down and like new people came and like replaced them and you know they got run out of their own neighborhood so um yeah people are definitely they're being forced into like these localized communities um but this is also like how everything is going for everyone yeah you know and i mean like everybody i don't know if you've been paying attention to like all these big companies now that are like adapting digital autonomous organizations you know that, that have like millions and millions of dollars in funding that are localizing everybody you know like on their own um, yeah but, but it's, it's not an art commune you know <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a massive global change of yeah there's a lot of positives, I think, to what I think is going to have to be a sort of revolution in, in home working and so on. I mean, you you save the time of the commute, you save the cost of the commute, which hopefully they won't start taking back out of people's wages. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, employers should pay for, for people's commutes. That seems, like, obvious to me. Like, yeah. I, I had a, a job in L.A. where I was commuting three hours a day you know, like an hour and a half there, an hour and a half home. And then I had to like wait for two hours because of the traffic, you know? So I was like, if you guys can't pay for my commute and like, why not just go back to, to for my commute? Why not just go back to freelancing? 
Yeah. Well, um, so it really seems like with how spread out everything is, you know, that if you don't live within like walking distance to your job, like that your employer should pay for your commute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I don't think people are going to want to go back to that. Uh, I know a lot of companies yeah. want to make everyone come back to the office. I just think a lot of people are going to want, are going to demand more flexible approaches to work, you know, a lot more working from home. Um, that's, that's reasonable though. I mean, like conditions are, are pretty bad now for yeah. like, a lot of in-person stuff, you know, and you know, sometimes like Jeff Bezos, it's like, thanks for like delivering that thing to me cheap you know yeah. thanks for like, hiring your lackeys to do it because i don't want to go in the store and like deal with other zombies <laughs> you know during during a pandemic like i'm happy to just click on the amazon order you know like, yeah yeah but we're both uh we're, we're all that stuff we're both a bit odd you're a lot more social than i am but we're both <laughs> but we're know. the we're both a bit a bit strange when it comes to that a lot of people like going out shopping and I don't, I don't think so anymore. I mean, look, people no. are very, like, inefficient now. There's a massive undersupply of workers. People can't get, like, basic things taken care of. Um, they're up against, like, strict laws for infrastructure and what they're allowed to build. Um, and I learned this living in Texas, you know, that people, like, they just can't build, you know, because yeah. they have to go against, like, all these city ordinances of, like, not being able to do, like, the most basic stuff. So, like, you can't even have an indoor restaurant now. You have yeah. to, like have a patio for people to dine on. So all these food trucks are, are just like a way to, to cope with that. <laughs> you know, it's actually <laughs> just that people can't do build restaurants. Yeah. You know, um, and all these craft breweries, it's actually just that people can't get a liquor license. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's all, all sorts of stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> people adapt. People adapt. But yeah, they're adapting to like these lower qualities of life and whether it's through like religion or meditation, they're adapting Um. To, to lesser to less things minimalism is all the rage and mm. that's uh there's a reason for that okay well we're gonna wrap up soon but let's try and end on an up note because i think like everybody we, te <laughs> we we tend to trend to the negative i think we're fans of dystopias and post-apocalyptic yes. fiction and and all right. that kind of thing um right. can you can you see an upside to oh, yeah to all of this to uh to the blessings of electric jesus oh big time yeah i mean for me it comes back to the imagination it comes back to constraint leading to creativity it comes back to people being more innovative when times are hard and people building alternative solutions people building new types of living communities that are outside of all these parameters you know we're artists and you know creative people and the tech and philosophy worlds kind of like merge recongregate you know realign you know there, there are so many new possibilities now it's this world of the imagination and we're, we're only just beginning um and especially now with how virtual reality is taking shape you know like on um, everything from like alt space you know to even games like like beat saber you know, mm. in like the the art world and in virtual reality too, or like the new ways to to view art. Um, we're entering a, a new period of history where we're able to scale the imagination, and I think the possibilities are are endless. And I think it's going to be really cool. And you know, Rome kind of has to fall, um, but now we're we're going to build a new empire, and that's exciting. And I, I'm really just excited by by what that can mean <laughs> I, I tend to be more more negative I, I have a saying a pessimist <laughs> a pessimist can only ever have a nice surprise um <laughs> right, right. but yeah I, I i look back historically and uh this is gonna sound really negative but uh <laughs> the, the, the black death right it was bad it uh it killed about a third of the european population so yeah. for every, everyone who died you know pretty tragic but after that when society began to recover a lot more serfs ended up free there was more right to travel people's pay increased there was a sort of flowering of the of the english renaissance and and so on so when you come out of the other side of times of hardship 
and you know the Rona is nowhere near remotely as bad as the as the Black Death, but uh, also society is very different. Things tend to change for the positive. They tend to become a bit more equitable. Um, yeah, I mean, hard times create strong men. You know, it's the new turning civilization. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm. I think you've convinced me to be more cautiously optimistic than I than I was. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I definitely see like a giant, you know, meltdown that's going to be followed by a rebirth. Um, but I'm not going to call it like the, the singularity or like QD or whatever. I don't think mm, it's going yeah. to happen overnight. Um, but I definitely think that it is going to happen. And I, I see pieces of it now. I see people that are, are rebuilding now that are doing incredible things. Um, and I so, just want to get more, more credit and more money and more mm. traction and, and more. Yeah. So you're an, you're an eschatological gradualist. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Um, okay, well, we're, we're going to wrap it up there, this kind of rambling conversation starting from, from one point is uh, going to be the format uh, of the cast of the future. Uh, right. Have you got any websites or anything you want to direct anyone to before we stop? Nope, I've gone dark because I don't want to deal with the current atmosphere of the internet, but that could change in the future. <laughs> Okay, well, if you ever have anything you, you want to, to pimp, uh, let me know. And uh, me and Rachel will be working together on quite a lot of stuff in the near future, so keep an eye on everything. Good night, everyone. Sweet. That was fun. Grimm's Tales. Music by Casket Bound.